Hello, this is Kim McAllister. I want to welcome you to the Nursing Research and Evidence-Based Class, um, Evidence-Based Practice Class. Uh, this is our first lecture. This is the introduction to what nursing research is and what evidence-based practice is. Um, you are all practicing nurses and you have all encountered problems in your nursing practice. There may be standards or policies or protocols that don't seem to make sense. Um, you may have noticed that some patients are having particular problems whereas others aren't. There's just a, a wide variety of issues and things that you may be experiencing. And we're going to use this course to explore those and look for evidence-based practice solutions that you can apply and use. Um, most all of the students who take this course and do the research project end up uh, turning around and presenting the results where they are at work. I am, over the last couple of years, I've seen uh, different hospitals or units change practice and do things that are really exciting based on the work that um, you, our students, have been doing. And so I can't wait to see what y'all come up with this time. So getting on with the introduction, um, we're going to look at these objectives today, and you can read through those. But we want to start out by determining what nursing research is. And in order to do that, we need to know what research is. And the word research literally means to search again. So we're looking into something very carefully. We're going to carry out some type of uh, systematic and very diligent inquiry and have a plan on how we're going to do this. And the goal is to discover new information or discover new relationships and solutions. And ultimately, we want to build the actual science base, the knowledge base of nursing. And nursing research takes all of this, all of what research is, and uses it to change lives, to improve lives. We have patients with ongoing health problems and disabilities, and we are continually trying to work to make their lives better, to improve their outcomes. We also want to prevent health problems. We want to promote health. We want to uh, be better and more efficient in our nursing practice, and so we look at ways to do that as well. So all of this is why we do nursing research. Evidence-based practice is taking all of that research and the knowledge that we synthesize through research and putting that into practice. And we're going to make changes in practice that will then be more effective and lead to better outcomes for our patients and even improve the healthcare system. And this is a simple schematic of that process where we take our best research evidence that we can find and we use our clinical expertise I know that some of you have been nurses a very short time. Some of you have been, like me, nurses for more than 30 years. And so your clinical expertise is going to vary. And then we also take the patient needs and values, what they want, what their desire is. Remember, that's not always what we think might be best. We need to look, put that all into practice and combine all this together. And this produces evidence-based practice. And you may be asking, why do we do this? Well, we do this to, as we already said, to make lives better. But we also do this because um, this is part of the essentials of baccalaureate nursing, which is um, what we do as nurses. And at the baccalaureate generalist level, this is why we do this, to promote practice and to care for patients and so on. And this is from the CCNE Essentials. So why is it important? It, again, develops our knowledge base, improves um, outcomes, and improves patient lives. So what role does research have in implement, implementing an evidence-based practice? Research can help us describe a problem. It can provide an explanation. It can say, this happens because of that. It can also predict, it can help us figure out which patients are more susceptible. Who's more likely to become sick? Who's more likely to develop complications? And then it also can give us control. When we learn 
why certain things happen, why certain things are related to each other, then we can change our practice and help control illness and help control how uh, patients progress. So where did nursing research come from? When did it start? Like much of nursing, it started with Florence Nightingale. And Florence Nightingale and her nurses were sent to the Crimea. Where did she go? Here she is. Oh, there she is. Um, she went with her nurses to the Crimea to help care for the soldiers who were dying um, after being wounded. And this was in the 1850s. Uh, she first arrived in 1854. And uh, this went on for, she was there for two years. When she arrived, the death rate was 42%. And by the time she finally got everything under control, the death rate was 2%. So nursing makes a difference. And she did this by changing the way the military saw illness and saw care for injured soldiers. And um, she did this through this systematic study. Um, these charts are a little confusing because we don't um, collect data and look at data this way anymore in these uh, pie charts, these wedge charts. But what you're looking at is from the center out, this is how many people um, died each month. The blue wedges are from uh, preventable causes. The black wedges are from other causes and the red wedges are from actual wounds uh, achieved and received in battle. And this is the very beginning of the war where there weren't very many illnesses. And then as it progressed, the uh, you can see the preventable deaths became very large. And then the next year, this would be placed on top of this wheel. You can see that the death rate began to go down and then became very, very low there at the end. When she arrived, the hospital tent was set up near the cesspool. There was no fresh air. There was no clean water. The soldiers were lying in the dirty uniforms that they were wounded in, and they were lying in their own filth. And so um, she and her nurses came in and began improving conditions. They finally um, were able to get the Ministry of Health in Great Britain to send out a prefabricated type of building for the hospital so that they had some control over the uh, kind of the climate conditions that the patients were in and uh, things began to get a lot better. But it took time before she was able to demonstrate to those in charge that her measures were helping. And once she was able to do that, then they began adopting what she was recommending and things got better. Uh, this bar graph, a kind of a fishbone diagram, is a little bit easier to see. And here again, you can see she, this is when things became really involved. And at this point, they began to listen to her and then implemented her changes. And you can see that uh, the preventable illnesses went down. So we had kind of a period of time where there was not a lot of nursing research done. And then moving into the 21st century, um, kind of evidence-based practice got started around 1970 in the medical community, and then kind of moved into nursing in the early 90s. And that's when we begin to see more research. And nurses have a big impact on healthy people. Um, Healthy People 2020 is um, almost finished, and then Healthy People 2030 is now being formulated. You can uh, click on the website. Let me go there real quick. And um, there are advisory committees. There are um, different, there's a listserv you can sign up for, and you can get updates. You can um, log in on Twitter and get updates. There's all kinds of materials, everything to look at. 
um, and you can see the draft of the framework. There are ways to participate. It's very exciting. And Healthy People has been very helpful in improving the health of people. It's very focused on um, health prevention. And we're also, we have the, the health care agency, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. This is a tremendous site to find uh, some of your research information, some of your resources. I recommend that you look here. I also recommend that you look at the National Institutes of Health. Um, AACN has some position statements on nursing research if you want to understand a little more about um, where nursing stands with research. Also, the Cochrane um, Foundation has a lot of good information. We'll also be looking at how to find information on CINAHL. You don't want to be finding your information on Google. You need to be using real nursing databases. So we also want to think about how nursing knowledge is acquired. In the past, we've relied on these things, on tradition. We do things because we've always done them. We look at people who are considered authorities. That may be someone in your hospital who is highly esteemed. A lot of your authors and uh, people who have published research, your nursing theorists, all, they're all considered authorities. Um, you just want to be sure that your authority really is someone who has evidence-based research behind what they're doing. We borrow things from other sciences. We bother, borrowed a lot from the medical field. We also borrow from sociology. We borrow from psychology. We nearly always have patients who are stressed and having problems. We borrow from those sciences to um, improve our nursing care. Trial and error. Uh, the problem with trial and error is when you have the error part, when things don't go well, sometimes that can harm patients. We rely a lot on personal experience, and the longer we've been a nurse, the more experience that we have. Sometimes our experience is not necessarily <laughs> what it should be, and so maybe we've had a limited experience. If you've just worked in one field or one area, or maybe one hospital, you haven't been exposed to different ways of doing things. Role modeling, you see this a lot. Uh, when you first began working where you work, you may have been assigned a mentor or a preceptor and you tailored your nursing care after that person. Intuition, uh, some people call this using your gut or working on a hunch. Um, generally speaking, this just doesn't come from the air. This actually is based on deeper knowledge, deeper remembering. Um, you may look at a patient and think, man, when I see a patient looking that way, they usually go bad. And that's based on a lot of assessments that you're doing and not really thinking about, but tucking them away in your memory. And then when you see that, it, it brings that back. And then reasoning, using inductive or deductive reasoning to figure out a problem. These are all common ways and ways that nursing has mainly built their, their knowledge. What we want to do is build our knowledge on evidence and, and research. And so an initiative began in 2007 where we started looking at how to build these, this knowledge in nursing school. And so we have uh, guidelines for both the undergraduate and graduate nursing roles, and uh, we follow those in the nursing programs. And so we utilize empirical knowledge, and we get that by using quantitative and qualitative research and outcomes. So we look at specific types of research, and we use that for giving high-quality care. So what is quantitative research? Quantitative research, we collect and confirm data and use a statistical analysis to draw conclusions. We have a hypothesis, and that may be one or two. We look at the relationship to variables. How does this affect that? How does smoking affect overall health? How does a low-fat diet improve health? How does a diet rich in HDL 
reduce cholesterol. These are our examples. Our result is a p-value, p means probability, and this goes from general to specific, so we're trying to narrow down what the actual cause of a problem is. Uh, it, it's what we call a 2D perspective. It's looking at just the facts, not feelings, not what it made me feel like, or, or other factors. It's looking at this affects this. And this is often done in nursing through a questionnaire or a survey tool. So we have different categories, and we're going to get into those specifically in the coming weeks. But uh, we have descriptive research where we're describing how something happens, like what kinds of patients tend to get this particular illness. A correlational would look at why does this cause that. A quasi-experimental is a type, it's exactly like experimental research, except there's no randomness in assigning people to groups. In an experiment, you have a group of people who are um, the control, they are not receiving the intervention, and then the experimental group is receiving the intervention. And they are randomly placed in one group or another. A quasi-experimental, um, they're not placed randomly in a group. And this is used when we know that a particular thing causes a problem. For example, we would not want to randomly assign pregnant women um, into a women who smoke and a women, women who don't smoke in order to look at what smoking when you're pregnant does. So we would use a quasi-experimental group and we would not assign people to smoking when they're pregnant. Quantitative research is very logical, it's objective, it's a very cause and effect, and it's going to test a particular theory. Qualitative research is used for recording the human experience. So rather than using a hypothesis, we have a theoretical framework. And it's the opposite from deductive, it's um, specific to general. And so this is usually less formal. Subjects have more freedom. They're not, they don't go to a particular clinic and to carry out a trial. Usually the researcher goes where the patients are and where the subjects are, and they may meet somewhere and talk for a while, and they come and they go. Um, this is usually a smaller sample size. They're generally conducted by interviews, and you get a lot of deep and rich experience. And these are generally conducted by interviews, case studies. Um, you can also have um, key informant interviews, that type of thing. So uh, it's very different. Uh, with the different categories for qualitative, you have phenomenological, where you're looking at a particular phenomenon. Grounded theory, where you have a theory, but you have based it on um, research and evidence. So it's the research has been founded, has, has some basis. The theory has some basis. Ethnographic, um, a lot of times this is where the researcher will put themselves in the same, uh, will be living amongst the people that they're talking, that they're working with. Exploratory descriptive is where they're looking um, at things more in depth. And then historical research is where you're going back. You're looking at uh, patients that went through a particular experience and what happened in that situation. Qualitative research, therefore, is more philosophic. It's naturalistic. It takes place in the environment where the person lives. Uh, it's more subjective. It's uh, you're, you're trying to discover and understand certain experiences. And the whole purpose may be for, the, for developing a theory. And the important thing to know is that quantitative and qualitative are not mutually exclusive. Um, a lot of times, research will use both. Um, for example, they'll use the qualitative to help develop the theory and then use the quantitative once they have a theory, and then we'll begin to develop it. Um, they can also be used at the same time. Um, on purpose, because they may be wanting to look at both a particular um, specific 
response to an intervention, but also find out um, more from the person about what really happens, what's, what happens in response to the study. This is just a table in your book which puts the two of them side by side if that's helpful for you. So outcomes research looks at the outcomes. How many patients had a pressure ulcer on this unit? Um, how many patients who used a medicated HMO received the care that they needed? Um, how did carrying out this practice change our practice? Did changing from betadine to chlorhexidine reduce, reduce the number of, um, of skin reactions? This type of thing. So how are you going to integrate evidence-based practice into your practice? Um, you would integrate that by looking at several different research topics if you had a problem and looking at how this, you know, doing, finding out what research was done on this problem and looking at the results and deciding that this is something that would be helpful to us. Um, you can use this type of thing for developing new practice guidelines. So you might look at how many uh, patients that were on Lantus had uh, problems maintaining their glucose control uh, during the day? Did they have spikes after meals? Okay, so uh, when, you know, what were some solutions for dealing with that? That's just a basic example. This is a guide that will be helpful to you as you are working on your research project. Remember that your systematic reviews of actual experiments, these things have uh, more strength than opinions and a single study. So this is why we're going to ask you to look at multiple studies before you make a determination of um, what your solution is going to be. The more studies that you look at, the stronger your evidence is going to be. So what do you as an entry-level nursing research do? Um, you're going to identify research problems, and we're going to ask you to do that in this course. You may be asked to assist with data collection. Um, your unit or your hospital may be part of some type of study with the Institute of Medicine or some bigger study, and you may be collecting information for that. So your job is collecting collecting information is to be sure that you're collecting what needs to be collected in the way that it needs to be collected. And we haven't really talked about bias, but sometimes we can be influenced, but we all have bias and we have to be um, on our guard with that so that we don't just select what we want the results to be. We have to look at what all of the results are. Uh, we also need to be able to critique and analyze a research study, which you're going to learn to do, and then summarize findings for practice. So this is what your role is, and this is what you're going to be doing in this course. Now, I also included a case study for you to look at, and you can do that. If you have any questions about that, let me know. But this would be just an example of what you could do, be looking at uh, patients who have hypertension. So when you have narrowed down your problem, we're going to use PICO as a way to formulate the question. So with PICO, who is your population or participants of interest? And in this case, it's someone, as we saw here, someone who is newly diagnosed with hypertension. And what is your intervention? Implementing medication teaching. So what, how are we going to do that? This is what we're going to look at as um, our intervention. And then C is what are we going to compare? We're going to compare patient outcomes for patients who receive teaching to those who do not. And then our outcome is increased adherence leads to decrease in blood pressure. So this is a PICO. And this is what we use to de develop our question. 
And um, if you'll look down here in the notes, I'll put some information in you in here for you about how to find some of these. And Cochrane, um, the Cochrane Collaboration has a lot of information. So Cochrane.org is a great place to look for information. And so let's, you, in doing your research, you found some practice guidelines for medication adherence, but you had trouble finding guidelines specific to hypertension. And so then how would you use inductive and deductive reasoning to help get through that? And I put some notes down here to help you understand inductive and deductive reasoning. And then uh, your research led you to a tool that's used by many hospitals. So how can you determine if this tool has evidence to support the use that you need to use in your practice? So you want to think about you don't want to just pick something because everyone's using it. You want to figure out how is this something that's going to be helpful. And you would use, look at guidelines from a, a credible source like the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality or uh, from Cochrane or some similar place. So after you completed your search of the evidence and found some studies, you want to decide how to rate the evidence that you found. And you can go back here to this grid and decide what type of study that it is, where does it fall, and decide how, how strong it is. So you want to be sure when you're collecting your research that you don't just have opinions or don't just have single studies. Look at some of your meta-analysis. This is where people look at uh, several different um, research studies and combine them. So you, you want to have a combination of all of these in your research. Well, I hope this has given you a good understanding of just the basics of what research is. Uh, this is just a kind of an overview of the course. We will um, break all of this down and go into it in more detail. The next lecture for this week also looks at what is a research problem, and so we'll go into more detail about what that is and how to, um, how to work on that.